Uh oh. Yeah, um, more Amber alerts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I think we're live, so we'll go ahead and get started. We're just going to mute everyone for now until you need to chime in. Okay. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi everyone. I'm happy to be with you all again. Uh, welcome to our uh, weekly Wednesday discussion. Um, and so every Wednesday for the past few months, we have been going over the book Evolution of Fiqh or Evolution of Islamic uh, Law or Jurisprudence by Dr. Bilal Phillips um, with the intention of educating ourselves on the development and evolution of Fiqh, a fiqh or Islamic Church of Judaism, and the madhab, madhab or the Islamic schools of thought. In order for us to, of course, one, educate ourselves on this very important topic, but also number two, in order for us to understand why there are different Islamic schools of thought and so many different opinions regarding particular specific practices of the religion, and why that's okay. Why it is perfectly fine for there to be different schools of thought, that there's not one particular medhab that's better than, and that's inherently better than another. In order for us as, as converts to be able to make a more educated decision on which medhab we want to follow if we choose to follow one, and also have mutual respect for others who may follow a different medhab than because we see many times in our Islamic communities, um, Muslims being heavily divided, depending on which medhab they follow, right? This misconception that this medhab is incorrect, it's, it's, it's haram, it's wrong. If you follow that medhab, you're, you know, you're, you're, following, you're, not, you're not following Islam. So we have this misconception in our communities, right? So through studying the history of the medhab or the Islamic schools of thought, as well as the history of fiqh in and of itself, we hope to further understand and develop a mutual respect and appreciation for all the different Madahab or Islamic schools of thought that exist today. So we have been going over section five of, the, of this book by Dr. Blau Phelps for the past, I'd say, couple months. Normally, each chapter would only spend maybe one or two three max uh, weeks going over, because they're relatively short. This particular chapter, we have been taking our time, really just kind of going over the different methods, because this chapter, which is chapter five, is kind of give us a very brief overview view of each um, medhab or school of thought um, that, was, that existed throughout Islamic history. This not only includes the four major schools of thought, but also other um, lesser schools of thought that either exist to a more limited capacity today or are no longer around today due to various circumstances. So today, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to be um, review, giving an overview from the book on Imam al-Shafi'i and Imam al-Hanbali. So these will be the last two of the four main schools of thought that we have yet to, to go over. So in child I will start with uh, Imam Shafi'i. So Imam Shafi'i, or his full name is Muhammad Ibn uh, Idris al-Shafi'i, was born in a town known as Gaza at, uh, at that time, and was, was in the Mediterranean coast, which was, at that time was known as Asham, in the year uh, 769 CE. So some just some main, uh, main facts about Imam al-Shafi'i. So we mentioned before, he was born in a town known as Gaza, but he traveled to Medina to study under Imam Malik. Imam Malik, of course, being one of the other four major schools of, of thought. And so he studied under Imam Malik up to Imam Malik's, Imam Malik's death. And after the passing of Imam Malik, may Allah be, be pleased with him, 
he went to go study under another scholar who was known as uh, uh, Imam Muhammad ibn al Hassan, who was a major student of Imam Abu Hanifa of the Hanafi school. So, due to this, Imam Shafi'i was able to study under two main methods uh, at that time directly under Imam Malik of the Maliki Madhab and under the Hanafi Madhab uh, through a major student of Imam Abu Hanifa. And so this allowed him to be exposed to two major Islamic schools of thought and learn their method of study and their uh, um, educational ideology. And to do to that, that allowed him to develop his own method or school of thought that was somewhat of a combination. So I'm sorry, if you're able to raise your mic, my, my volume is as well as I can hardly hear you. Is anyone else having a hard time hearing me? No, brother Kenneth, I can hear you just fine. Yeah, Cause I have two people. Sister Kat is saying it's breaking up really badly. Sister Jenny says she can't hear me. I know Sister Rashid I mentioned before, so it looks like people are having different challenges, but um, if yeah, anyone has, I think, I think if, they, if they use another dial-in number, um, that's what I did, and it was much better. Okay. And yeah, so those of you, for those of you who are having trouble, try using a different dial-in number like Sister Rashida suggested, or just try signing out and signing back in and see if that solves uh, the problem, inshallah. So to continue on, as we were just discussing, um, due to his study under two major schools of thought, the Maliki Madhab um, directly under Imam Malik, and the Hanafi Madhab to a major um, scholar and student of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam al Shafi'i developed his own Madhab that was somewhat of a combination of these two. And this Madhab was known at that time as Al Madhab al Qadi, which means the old school of thought. And we're going to get to why it's referred to as the old school of thought in, in just, just a little bit. So, and, it's, and I think it's very important to mention when we get to, we're just, so we're going to focus a little bit of time when we get to the point as to why it's called the old school of thought. So I'm sure I'm looking forward to that. So essentially, after Imam uh, al Shafi'i was finished um, studying under Imam Muhammad ibn al Hassan, he then started to travel to uh, Yemen in order to learn under Imam Abu Layf of the Layfi Madhab, who we discussed in previous previous sessions. Now, unfortunately, um, uh, Imam al Layf passed away by the time that Imam al Shafi'i reached, um, reached Yemen. So he was not able to study directly under him, but be, but settling in this area where Imam Alif's Medhab was rampant and was very um, fruitful allowed him to be exposed to his Medhab and learn a lot of Imam Alif's Medhab. And it's important to mention, and we mentioned this in, in a previous session, that Imam al Shafi'i had a lot of respect for Imam Alif to the point where he felt that. Imam al-Layf's um, um, particular methodology of the hadith was superior to Imam Malik in Imam al shafiis opinion. So, and I feel like it's important to mention because the Layfi Madhab is essentially extinct. You're, not, you're, not, you're no longer going to find followers of that Madhab today. But it's not because that, that Madhab was necessarily inferior to the others, but due to other circumstances. And the fact that Imam Shafi'i had a lot of respect for Imam Malik to the point where he felt that in certain aspects he was a superior scholar to Imam Malik shows that it wasn't due to the Medhab being inherently inferior. It was just due to other other circumstances, right? And so and so basically, after being exposed to Imam Alayf's um Medhab and learning of the different evidences that you know, Imam Ali had in his Medhab, Imam al Shafi'i updated his own Medhab, which was known as Al Medhab al Jadid, the new Medhab. 
Hence why the one before was known as the method of Paldim at some point, the old, the old method. So due to being exposed to different evidences and sources that the Leiti method, method had access to, Imam al-Shafi'i made changes to his own verdicts and opinions based off the evidence that was, was provided. And it's very important for us to mention this because this, this gives us an indication on how these major scholars would approach them, or approach Islamic law, right? They were not arrogant. They were not concerned primarily with the promotion of their school of thought. Their main purpose was to make the practice of Islam as close to as it needs to be as possible, right? And if there was something in their verdict or their opinions that was proven to the contrary from other sources that they felt was were more authentic, they would change their opinions right away. Because at the end of the day, what was most important for them was to make it them, for the, themselves and for the those who were their students to follow the Sirat al Mustaqim, the straight path, as closely as possible. They were not concerned with becoming famous or becoming or just gaining more and more support for their school of thought. That was not their primary objective. They were very flexible in in their in their education based off of what sources were were, were authentic. And the fact that Imam al-Shafi'i updated his school of thought after being exposed to other sources which showed him, um, which kind of contradicted his previous, his own previous opinions and verdicts shows that, right? So a couple other important uh, facts of Imam uh, al-Shafi'i. He, one of them, the books that he, that he wrote, so he's also known to be um, the very first uh, according to Dr. Bilal Phillips, but he's, he has the distinction of being the very first imam to systematize the fundamental principles of fiqh in a book that he recorded known as Al-Risala. The full name of this book is um, Al-Kitab Al-Risala Fi Usul Fiqh, or translated in English would be Book of the Message um, in uh, the Sciences of, uh, of, of, of Fiqh, is how you would translate it translate this book in, in English. And so according to some sources, this was the, like the very first book that kind of systemized the whole science of, of them, right? So these are just some main facts of Imam al-Shafi'i. And so from here, we're going to go into the sources of law that's used by this particular method. But before we go to that, are there any questions about some of the facts that we went over with uh, in regards to Imam Shafi or any um, comments that anyone would like to share. All right. So in Charles Town, we're going to go into the uh, sources of law that were used by the Shafi Ahmed Heb. And we discussed, of course, the sources of law in previous uh, classes as, as well. Each Medhab had their own sources in which they would use to derive certain uh, verdicts of, of Islamic law. Of course, as with the others, the Quran and the Sunnah were there, where the, 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 the Shafi'i Ahmed has primary sources of Islamic law, and this is going to be this way for every, uh, every Medhab. After that, um, the next, the third, the third source is, of course, the Ijma'ah, the Ijma'ah of the, um, the, of the Sahaba. So a quick question for everyone, who here can remind us what does Ijma'ah mean? What does it mean when we say the Ijma'ah of the Sahaba? Anyone remember? Brother Daniel, you want to remind us? Uh, it, it, uh, it, 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 uh, I forgot yeah, the it's 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 Like Jama, like a uh, group, uh, group consensus. Yes. 
Yes, correct. So ijma is referred to as the consensus of the of the Sahaba. So basically, if they could not find anything in regards to the situation in the situation in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him, they would then go to the consensus from the companion, the direct companion of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then their fourth source was the individual opinions of the Sahaba. So this is, of course, very similar to the other uh, schools of thought that we we went over. The fifth one being the fifth source of law is Qiyas, also known as um, Ishtihad, which essentially translates to your own uh, reason deductions based off what you know from the uh, Quran and, and the Sunnah. His sixth, the sixth source of law from the school is known as um, Ishtihad. And we're not going to go into too much detail on the meaning of, of, of this of this particular word. The main thing I think is for us to know is is to have is very similar to other terms we use in other schools of thought like um, istihan and istislah, which basically means um, coming up with a uh, opinion based off of um, what is most relevant and practical for the culture or society that you happen to be a part of that's critic, that's still relevant to the Quran and, and, and the Sunnah. And that's really the main thing we need to know in terms of is to have, is to stand, is to fly. Um, you know, of course, the, the, these, these terms do have different um, meanings from a more technical standpoint, but overall, the, the purposes are essentially the, 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 the same. So in terms of the main students in the Shafi'i Metab. And again, the reason why we sometimes spend a little bit of time discussing some of their students is these students are kind of the driving force towards the growth of these different Metahid, right? Because many times these scholars themselves, like I mentioned, were not primarily concerned with expanding their school of thought. A lot of this comes from their students. So two main students to know in terms of the Sheikh Ayyad. The first one's name is um, Ismail Ibn Yahya al Rizani. He was um, a constant companion of the Sheikh throughout his days um, in in Egypt. So he was a major major student of his that was with him for a very, very long time. He is known to have written a book known as Zikah Sheikh So based off his interactions and his study of Imam al-Shafi'i, he compiled a book of Imam al-Shafi'i's uh, rulings in, in regards to, uh, regards to Um And this was widely used within the, the Shafi'i Methab. And the other student uh, mentioned here is um, Yusuf, Yusuf ibn Yahya. And he succeeded Imam al-Shafi'i as the main teacher of the Shafi'i Methab. Right, so after Imam al-Shafi'i passed away, Yusuf, Yusuf ibn Yahya became the major teacher of the Methad after him. And that's all we'll mention in regards to um, his, his students. Again, we don't want to focus too much in this discussion on the vivid details of these different students and, and, and things of that nature because our main objective is not to memorize these students and, and um, things of that nature, but more and just to kind of give us a little bit of background information how the medhab that we're looking at expanded, right? Because as we mentioned before, and it's very important to always um, emphasize this, that the uh, many reasons as to why a lot of these schools of thought expanded and grew was not because they just were superior to others, but to other circumstances such as students of those schools of thought being put in particular positions of power which allowed them to really expand the influence of that of that school of thought, right? And other circumstances as, as well. So in terms of today, where do you find many uh, where do you find many of the followers of the Sheikh that you met have? So you'll find many of them in Egypt, uh, Southern Arabia, you know, in Yemen, Yemen, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, East Africa. 
And so this is where you'll find many of the practice uh, practitioners of the Shafi'i Madhab today. So before we go on to Imam Hanbali, are there any questions or comments in regards to the, the Shafi'i Madhab that we went over that anyone would like to chime in? Or any questions if I said anything that was confusing or I lost anybody? All right, clear, inshallah. So inshallah, we'll go ahead and move forward to uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, which is the final of the major four schools of thought that we have yet to, to go over. So Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was born in Baghdad in the year 778 uh, CE. Uh, and his primary field of study was narration, memorization, and compilation of hadith. He was known as one of the best uh, scholars of hadith during his, his time, right? And another very um, interesting fact is there are there were two particular students of his that were major scholars of hadith that we are very well known of, we very well know today. Does anyone here know the two scholars of hadith that I'm referring to who were scholars who were students of Imam Ahmed? I'll give you guys a hint. These are two scholars that everyone here has heard of, more than one. Anyone want to take a guess? You guys are giving me just giving me crickets today. All right, I'll let you guys off the off the off the hook. Um, I'll I'll say one, but one of you have to say the, the other. So one of these students was Imam Imam Bukhari, um, as of course the uh, as Bukhari, the uh, one who we all are very very well aware of, who was a major scholar of hadith and compiled so many hadith that we use today. So that was one of his major students. Um, that we're all very, very familiar with. Um, so who, who's the other? Come on, guys, how did, take a guess. This is another major scholar of hadith that we're all very, very familiar with. Okay. Uh, again, I'm... I can hear Jeffrey. Jeffrey's at least trying. I can hear him. him, him I can hear. I can hear his his brain wheel. His wheel. His brain wheel. I can't. I, I'm lost. I'm done. I'm done. I'm Imam Muslim. Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. These were two students under Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. I know you guys know the answer, but I guess everyone's just kind of feeling feeling shy tonight. So. This is kind of just goes to show you how much of a big deal Imam Ahmed was when it came, when it came to the study of, of hadith. So Imam Ahmed went through a series of persecutions under the Islamic uh, state during his, his time. I know a lot of us are not, are not um, surprised to hear that because unfortunately, Throughout our study of this book, there have been many, many examples given of major scholars facing persecution from the Islamic State for one reason or another. One of the biggest reasons why Imam uh, Ibn Hanbal faced persecution was due to his rejection of the um, Mu'tazila ideology. And we spoke about this ideology before, but just to give a little bit of background information, the Mu'tazilites were a particular ideology uh, under under Islam, though it could be argued whether or not it could be considered Islamic or not, but they were a group of Muslims who were heavily influenced by Greek and Roman philosophy. So they had a huge emphasis on the power and importance and influence of human reason, and that with human reason and human logic, we can answer most, if not all, of the universe's questions. Right, and one of their 
one of the arguments or beliefs of the Muqtazilites were uh, was that the Quran was created. It was not direct revelation from God, but more of a creation, more something that was just created and compiled. So Imam Ahmed, of course, rejected this idea of the Quran being created, and due to that faced a lot of persecution from the Islamic State, which at the time followed the Muqtazila philosophy and ideology. This forced him to eventually kind of go into hiding and not really be able to, to teach or practice for, for a while in order to avoid further persecution until um, the Khalifa was taken over by um, Khalif and Mutalakil, who ended up completely dismantling the, the philosophy of Mutazila as the main ideology of the Islamic state, which allowed him to go back to practicing what, what he preached. So, one of the Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal's major books was known as um, Al Musnad which basically means like the pure tradition or the unaltered tradition. And this book had a, comp a compilation of over 30,000 ahadith, right? Over 30,000 ahadith. So this really comes to show you how important the study of hadith was to Imam, Imam Ahmed. To the point where, and this I know Brother Dan and I, we spoke about this previously before that. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal tried to avoid giving his personal opinion on matters to as much as he could, as, as he possibly could, mainly wanting to focus on what the hadith say in regards to matters. Now, if he couldn't find a hadith which directly discussed whatever particular topic or issue that he or his students ended up with, he would then offer his own opinion, but he forbade his students from recording his he didn't want them recording his opinion. So again, just really highlighting to us the um, humility of the of these scholars. They wanted to make sure that people didn't take their words and treat them as if they were from 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 Allah or anything. Right? They wanted they were very humble and they always wanted to be very careful into saying anything that was wrong or misguiding people. So Imam Ahmed would forbid his students from basically recording his, his opinion. Thus, the recording of, of his opinions came from the students of his students. So whenever his students would go and discuss his, his opinions, their students would, would go and record Imam Shafi's opinions that way. So from here, we'll go into the sources of law by the Hanbali Mithat. We'll go ahead and so real quick, we'll call Anson, Ijma, that's all the same just like the previous um, previous Medhab. Now the fourth fourth um, uh, source of law is also the same, the individual opinion of the companions. Now the fifth source, this is where it's a little different. And I remember this is where Brother Daniel and I we were talking about this. So for Imam Ahmed, um, the fifth source of law, if the other four could be, if nothing for the other four could be found, was uh, the Hadith Zayf. Or weak hadith, hadith which were weak in in narration. So, in previous madhab, um, it was payas or it's jihad, basically your own reason, opinion based on your knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah. But for Imam Ahmed, as mentioned previously, he would try to avoid putting forth his opinion if it could be avoided. Where he even held weak a hadith as legitimate sources of law if nothing could be found in the previous in previous sources. But this is not but except in really two um, exceptions. One exception is if the narration of hadith was weak due to the narrator being someone who was a facet or basically someone who was a very you known a very corrupted individual and who was spread, spread corruption or someone who was a kizbaz, someone who was known as a liar, a very consistent liar. So if the hadith was weak due to those two reasons, then he would reject it. But if it was weak just due to the chain of narration of other, other instances, he would consider uh, the Aif hadith or weak hadith as a legitimate source of the law if nothing could be found from the 
other four uh, sources. His sixth, and then finally, his sixth source was Priyas or HD Had, which we discussed previously. So if he couldn't find anything in any of the other sources, then reasoned opinion and, and reasoned deduction would be the only thing that, that was left. This is more of like a last. Um, like a last ditch effort or so like, like something that you would have no choice but to, but to go with. So the sixth source is basically if absolutely nothing can be found even in even a week ahead. Right? And so these were the um, sources of law for the Hanbali Methab. Main students of the Hanbali Methab we discussed. Um, two of his, his two sons were his main students were, were Saleh and Abdullah. But also, as you mentioned before, Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, who are very well and very well known scholars of hadith today, were also students under Imam Ahmed, which I found to be very interesting. I actually did not know that before. I I read this, this chapter. Very, very interesting. So now in terms of the followers of the Hanafi Methab today. So majority of the followers in this Methab will be found in Palestine and Saudi Arabia. So, and there's a very interesting reason as to why you, you'll find the Hanbali Methab very prominent in, in Saudi Arabia. Now, normally I would like to ask if anyone knows the answer to this, but given the fact that before you guys seem kind of tight lipped today, I'll just go ahead and just jump right into the, the answer, all right? So, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the term. Wahhabi, right? Oh, he's a Wahhabi, stay away from Wahhabis. It's a term that, you know, there's a very well known, not even in the Muslim community, even in America, uh, even in America, maybe even across the world, it's Wahhabi. What is this Wahhabi? And so this is derived from a scholar known as Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, who essentially, not just not to get into too much detail, kind of revived the the true practice of Islam in the Saudi, uh, in Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula of that particular, particular time. And so, Ab, um, so Abdul ibn, I'm sorry, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was uh, a scholar who learned under scholars who were of the Hanbali Methab. Thus, um, Abdul Wahhab's main practice was from the Hanbali Methab. Due to that, due to that reason, this caused the Hanbali men had to be very prominent with uh, modern Saudi Arabia today. And so that's all we have for the Hanbali Medheb. And we'll go ahead and stop right here to where we can open the floor for questions and comments. And just real quick, I do apologize. Um, Oh, wait. Looks like you guys actually did answer. You guys answered in the chat. Um, but I do apologize if I seemed a little um, uh, kind of jittery today. Uh, just unfortunately, I had a full all nighter, and so I may have wanted to move off. So I do apologize if I, if I didn't see that you did a, a, a good job. But just a couple uh, quick uh, quick comments in, in regards to in regards to this, I guess a couple of questions for me to, to ask all of you so we can get a conversation going. So my first question for you guys is, what are some lessons that um, that you guys personally personally got from the story of Imam Shafi'i or Imam Hanbal that we went over today? What are some lessons that you guys got? Um, what I know is that he was raised by a single mom, Imam Shafi, right? Right. I'm sorry, I got disconnected. So what do we know about Imam Shafi? Is that what you asked? No, I'm asking where, well, you, you can also do that as well. Um, but I was, my question was, what are some lessons that you all got from what we know? Oh, about? sorry, sorry. My, Shafi, but sorry. if you do have some fun facts, you can also please feel free to share that with us as well. Of course, we want to talk about. Sure. Well, I'll mention those just because um, I got um, 
uh, attracted to learning uh, his math have because he was raised by a single mom who at the age of five, I mean, her invest, her biggest investment was him. And at the age of five, she used to um, take him to the masjid for Fajr and she would wait outside for him. And so she would take him to learn and um, she was very dedicated uh, to him. Um, and I think a lot of people don't know about that as far as um, single moms and how um, it's not something new. And even though sometimes it's looked down upon within our communities, we have scholars such as Imam Shafi being raised by a single mom. Oh, very, very, very good point. And you know, even for just a little bit of a time, the Prophet Muhammad technically had a single mom because his father passed away before he was born. Unfortunately, his mother passed away when the Prophet was very young, but even he also had a, a single mother. So very, very, uh, very good point. But are there any lessons that um, others want to share that we kind of, that you got from what we went over today? And while you guys are thinking about that, I saw that people actually were answering my question in the chat in regards to who were the who were like two major scholars of hadith that uh, practiced that studied under you know, Ahmed. Sister Nahila, you were correct. I guess I'm sorry I didn't see that. Um, Sister Kat, you said Imam and Jauzi. I'll be honest, maybe that's true. I just I don't know. Um, he wasn't mentioned in, in the book. Either. So I I don't I do not know that. I guess, Brother Kenneth, I will be interested in learning more about, um, I guess it was the fifth uh, source for Imam uh, Ahmed. Yeah, yeah where you said that he would, that was, that was he would use the uh, weak hadith versus his own opinion. And um, sorry, I'm getting a call. Can you still hear, still hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I would kind of, I would be interested in how that has impacted any of um, the teaching, you know, coming out of, of that math app specifically. A very good question. Um, unfortunately, it's a question I do not know the whole answer to in terms of how that source of law impacted the, um, in the practice, in the practice of that method as a whole. However, I can just tell you by my own personal experience of how that has affected me with those who practice the, the chef of the method, because I do have a few friends that practice that method. And it's interesting because, at least thus far, there are very few methods I've seen that use weak hadith as a legitimate source of law. Uh, Imam and uh, Hanbal uh, seems to be um, unique in that particular aspect. And so due to that, you'll find, many, at least I'll talk about my, me personally, whenever I have discussions with particular friends of mine who follow that method, I would find between us many differences and a, little, a few more technical aspects that I don't, I don't find in other Muslims who follow other methods where I'm like, where are you getting that opinion? Mainly be, because out of the four Badahib, Imam and ah, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal is the only one that uses the weak hadith of the source of law. Due to that, you'll find many different opinions between it in, 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 within the Hanbal school in regards to the other forms of school, right? And that's just the, that's some of the personal experiences that I, I've had in terms of that the impact of that source of law and the Hanbali Metham versus the other three major school thoughts. Uh, any anyone else? Or does anyone have an answer for Sustarashi that they want to, that they want to
I was actually on mute. I was asking um, if you would be willing to share one of the examples of something that came up. Right. So for I'll give you an example. Um, this is actually a few days ago. Um, I, a friend of mine, a friend and I were actually uh, praying together, right? And I was leading. And so I started with Allah who I thought, and I started saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim silently. And then my friend started yelling at me, like, what, what are you doing? Why are you praying quietly? And I was like, well, no, I'm saying the, the Bismillah silently. And my friend was telling me, no, that's wrong. You're supposed to say it out loud because um, the Sheikh Ali, I'm sorry, actually, I'm, saying Sheikh, I'm sorry, come on, I'm sorry, I got that mixed up. So, this is what I just said, that's what I'm thinking about the Sheikh Ali Madhab. But in terms of the, the Hanbali Madhab, um, I can't remember, I can't think of a very a specific case right now, um, but I just, remember that there's been a couple of times with some friends of mine who follow that particular medheb to where I just noticed it was a little bit different from, from, from what I knew based on what I was exposed to. Unfortunately, Sister Rashida, I can't think of a specific example right now. Um, okay. I'm, my head's okay. All over the place no right now. But, I was just, you know, I was just I, curious. I, I was if I can think of another one, if I can think of a specific example that I, I experienced, inshallah, I will share that with you. In, 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 in. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions, comments, lessons anyone wants to share in regards to what we went over today? Yeah, I'm going to call on my friend, Brother Daniel. Brother Daniel, why don't you, uh, do you have particular experience similar to what Sister Rashida is asking? I remember you and I were talking about uh, the Hanbali Medhab, and you told me that, I remember you telling me that if you were to follow a particular Medhab, it would be that one due to that sixth source of, or that fifth source of law of, of, of the Hadith. Yes, correct. Are you uh, kind of getting a, a little, uh, do you want a little input as to as to why I would prefer yeah, that? Yeah, why don't, yeah, so why don't you elaborate for us on that? And that can kind of like give us a bit of, um, that can really kind of help us somewhat answer Rashida's question in terms of like some experiences in regards to that, that okay. source of law that's unique within the Hanbali method. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, I guess for the reason why I uh, decide to, um, Follow that is oh, we, uh, you, you can look at different aspects. Uh, first off, as we um, learn from uh, uh, Imam uh, Ahmed today, uh, that he was a I mean, uh, an extremely prominent scholar, one of the latest scholars, and he was the one who uh, eventually led to the education and application of the Hadith for um, Imam Muslim and Imam Abahari. Um, when we're relying upon those um, books for a, um, hadith, that's really the madhab that we're looking upon as to what we, um, you know, decipher as what, um, you know, is acceptable in our eyes in regards for what is uh, what is sahih or what's the different level and grades of those um, of those hadith that we're that we're narrating. And in the same case, you know, the uh, when it all comes back down, you know, the reason why we're taking uh, hadith is to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we have a reliable uh, source of somebody who has um, taken other um, hadith, um, but we don't have other narrations, but it's still from the same person, um, you know, I think it's better for us to try to follow uh, as well as possible to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as what we possibly can, enough that um, if we have a narration from a hadith that has not been, uh, um, you know, narrated from uh, from multiple people, I think it's better uh, and, and closer to following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, there's also the debate, um, you know, I'll give the, se the second side of that, which is, you know, we should have two sources of uh, information when we take something as, a, um, as truthful, usually. 
Um, so it kind of conflicts with my own, uh, <laughs> my own, uh, my own beliefs too. Um, so it's, uh, and, and usually when I, when it comes to, um, like we, uh, we, uh, a hadith, uh, you know, um, I will, uh, accept things out of the, um, uh, what sitar, uh, kitaba, hadith, the six uh, reliable sources of, a uh, hadith, uh, um, of Hadith, Suha Bukhari, Suhi Muslim, uh, Ibn uh, Ijma, um, 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 uh, Ahmed, uh, uh, Tirmidhi, and then uh, I'm missing uh, I'm missing one. Um, but so I mean that's uh, just generally the basis from that. I'll, I'll accept, of course, the head uh, on the weak Hadith from um, from them. But of course, you know, when I come across a weak Hadith, uh, weak hadith I always want to uh, question where it's coming from, who the source is, and make sure that's a reliable source. So, um, so um, I kind of just rambled on here. <laughs> no, 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 you're good. No, that's very interesting um, pers perspective, um, and I think you know you sharing that with us. I think. Uh, Kind of gives or can kind of help us kind of give a good indication, understanding of what perhaps the um, uh, reason why you know, Imam uh, Hanbali, Imam al Hanbal held weight to the Hadith when other schools uh, typically typically didn't. So I do thank you for kind of sharing with us that perspective. I just found that very interesting when and I were, were speaking about it, and I thought it would be good for you know others to kind of hear your perspective as to why. Uh, why if you would pick a myth have you so you would see what the third the hand of the but um, I'm just not and I think uh, uh compared to um a lot uh a, a few of you here I still may be one of the um newer uh, newer Muslims being only a Muslim for for three years now. Um so I'm still kind of developing my means for um you know what what i deem uh, acceptable when i initially got into it um that was my initial introduction to it because uh you know follow this uh um quran as soon as as close as possible um but as i'm researching into it you know who goes to say that my position on that may possibly change just as uh, these other uh imams have changed over time as well so alhamdulillah right. and you know what that's fine Absolutely. That's perfectly fine. And I think that's, that's the most important thing for us to, to understand. And perhaps we can, we can close, close with this is, you know, regardless of what, you know, med have a school thought you follow or others follow, you know, it's okay to have, it's important for us to have mutual respect and love for all of these scholars. And knowing that all of these medad, these schools of thought are authentic and are Correct, and I think especially for us as converts, it's, it's important for us to not start with, but important for us to really expose ourselves to um, these, these different methods in order for us to decide which school of thought or method is best for us if we choose to follow a, a particular particular method. Hence, why I think it's best to be to be studying what we're, what, what we're studying right now, um, Brother Danny. So you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, correct myself uh, here because it bothered me. Kutub uh, al Sita, the six uh, canonical books of uh, or canonical books of, uh, of Hadith, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, Sunan Abu Dawood, uh, Sunan Al uh, Sunan Al Nisa, and then Sunan Ibn Majah. So just wanted to make that correction for myself. Stuff for. No, understood. Jazak, jazakallah khair. But all right, before um, we close, are there any other questions, comments, or suggestions? Brother Jeff, do you have any questions? I know you said before you felt like we were having a hard time. No, I don't have any at this time. I'll, have, I'll think of some over the week. <laughs> all right, no problem. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You know, you okay. have uh, Can do. my number. Um, All right, any other questions or, or comments? All right, so real quick uh, announcement, guys. Uh, so inshallah ta'ala, we may be putting the evolution of fiqh book on, on hold 
uh, starting either next week or the week after that. Uh, we've been discussing behind the scenes of going over a kind of having someone of like a, a book overview in regards to the current issue that we're we're focused on, of course, being Black Lives Matter and the importance of racial uh, racial equality. And so please do stay tuned uh, for that. We decided that every um, Wednesday, once we, once we identify a book to kind of help us help educate ourselves on this, this issue and on the history of um, the oppression of, um, the, of the African-American community and the minority community in, in our country in, in general, because it's very important for us to understand this, this, this history, right? Because, you know, as we mentioned many, many times, part of our religion, a very important aspect of our religion is standing up for justice and standing up for what's right and making a positive change in our communities. And so it's very important for us to be educated on this. And now that, um, so we feel that now is the perfect time to really discuss this, this issue as an embrace family and community in order for us to make sure we're all educated on this issue and in order for us to start having conversations on how we can pra um, practically, not practically, but how we can properly respond to these issues. So that's gonna be the plan moving forward um, that every Wednesday we're being going after we identify a book in which to use. This book will be a book which gives us background information and history around um, the uh, African-American oppression and things of, of that nature. So please do uh, stay tuned, uh, inshallah ta'ala. Tomorrow we'll also be continuing our weekly Hadith Rush program. Uh, tomorrow it'll be, it'll be my turn. Every Thursday, uh, between 8 and 9 central time, 9 and 10 Eastern time, we go over a number of hadith, explain their major themes, and then we just open the floor and we just share our own reflections and thoughts in regards to that hadith known as Hadith Rush. I ask all of you to please try and join us tomorrow. Um, inshallah ta'ala, again, 8 to 9 uh, central time, 9 to 10 Eastern time. So with that, inshallah, Tyler will go ahead. And wait, 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 one second. Um, I just put in the comments. So tomorrow also reverts reality at 8, 11 a.m. And please mark your calendars for Saturday, inshallah, in case you don't make it tomorrow and you don't hear the announcements. We're having a movie watch or documentary watch. Um, so we'll be reposting and posting the flyer. Um, so it's on the documentary 13th to better understand um, the, the core, the root cause, or uh, a little bit more of what's happening in terms of our um, black brothers and sisters. And do we have, um, do we have a like guest speaker or topic you want to reveal for Reverse Reality tomorrow, or is that still a surprise? No, so we have, um, so tomorrow's gonna be, um, we're gonna be hearing from kids, children of reverts. So we're gonna have a sister Alia, who is a therapist. Um, and we're gonna have uh, brother Omar Regan, inshallah. Hmm, All right, so you're hearing it here first, guys. So inshallah, I hope you, hope you guys are all able to join the Reaver Realities tomorrow for, uh, sounds like a very special, special segment, inshallah. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and, and close. Allahumma subhanahu wa bihamdik ashira wa la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka na utubu ilayk. Jazakumullahu khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.